All right. Well, we are uh, we're we're familiar, somewhat unfamiliar territory. It seems uh, back in back in class, and I'm glad we are, and glad you are, and uh, this particular. Although I feel strange because though this room I'm used to, I'm usually over there, facing that way. So this seems a little odd, but. Um, I, uh, I promise if I do what I sometimes, see, I'm going to have to get used to this right here, too. He's got me in a box. Got me in a box. And I, and I normally do a lot of whatever, but uh, can't do that right now. If I do, I'll throw that on. Anyway, uh, we're going to be in the book of Jude. And uh, so that's where you can be camping out. It's not that we won't ever reference anything else. But that's our study. Obviously, we'll reference some other things uh, occasionally because of uh, how it ties in to the greater uh, teaching the New Testament and uh, similar writings from those that, compile the book, that uh, comprise all the books of the New Testament. But uh, Jude, every once in a while, here's where you can throw somebody off. And I'm not going to say that it's ever happened here. We're going to, in fact, we're going to say it's never happened here at Creve Hall. But I know it has happened, and it's happened to me, where I referenced Jude, verse whatever, 10, one time in a class. Can you guess where I'm headed? It was, it was, and somebody said, what chapter? Uh, and uh, one chapter. So if we just say verse whatever, yeah, you know what chapter we're, we're staying in the whole time. Uh, Jude has but one chapter. And you may wonder how we're going to get a whole quarter or how we're going to take a whole quarter for one chapter. Well, I can do it. <laughs> Jenna might say I could take a whole quarter on five verses, uh, you know. But... Uh, it, uh, it has been done and uh, can be done. And if we get to week, we covered it, something else for three. But uh, that's, that's the goal. And uh, I'm glad that, that you wanted to study this book. That I think sometimes is because it's one chapter, we don't get quite as many lessons from. Because it's one chapter. I mean, you know, if you look at the book of Romans, for example, just to choose... At random, 16 chapters. And the bigger the book, the more things there, the more things to choose from topically if you're preaching a sermon, uh, at least from the sermon perspective, uh, in a worship service, if not in a class perspective. So I don't think we have as many lessons from Jude, uh, and, and so we're not, we're not used to going there. But uh, I, think, I think it's more than worthy, obviously. So, uh, I just realized of something that I did not do, did not grab out of my office. So, uh, I'll bring it to you next week. Uh, and um, it's a handout that I've, I found that would be helpful, I thought, on Jude, on who he is, uh, on the ongoing uh, discussion and why uh, there's been debate on who specifically this Jude is, but going with the most, I think, most reliable scholarship uh, that there is, uh, and it's not just going with the numbers, I, I, I think the numbers are what they are because it's the most reliable. I think that's what drove the numbers, not the other way around. And so I think going with the most reliable numbers there are... Um, we're talking about the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, and so, <clears throat> when you get to, before we get to the opening, verses 1 and 2 uh, is all we'll cover as far as text today, because we're going to do some introductory to what was going on, purpose of the letter, theme, that sort of thing, uh, who Jude was. Uh, Jude, named Judas, not Iscariot. Common name back then. Uh, you know, somebody might have the name Robert. They may go by Robert. Somebody may have the name 
Robert and they go by Rob. Somebody else goes by Robbie. Uh, and so on. You can see this in a lot. Of, we're used to that sort of thing uh, in our culture and time as well. Uh, but going with the most reliable scholarship, Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, I think, not the apostle. Uh, and um, that's, what we're going, that's what I'm going with anyway. You can go with what you want, but I'm going with that. Uh, and so I want to recommend a couple of things to you at the beginning, all right, relating to Jude. Um, I'm, I'm going to be pulling from a lot of different sources uh, and, and my own stuff as, as well from earlier studies on Jude. If you have never read, first of all, if you've not read much from John MacArthur, great writer, great author. Uh, get past his Calvinism, and if you're just talking about Christian living, there's nobody better. If you're just talking about Christian living, there's nobody better. Uh, John MacArthur, outstanding author, wrote 12 Ordinary Men. And it is a study of every individual apostle. And it is a, a great, great study, and I want to recommend uh, that to you. Um, Aubrey Johnson, many of you may know Aubrey Johnson or of Aubrey Johnson. Uh, Aubrey is the uh, pulpit minister for the uh, Old Hickory Congregation. Uh, north side of Nashville, of course, uh, had formerly been down in Franklin at the Southern Hills Church. Aubrey writes a lot of, of stuff that's been placed in, uh, for example, Gospel Advocate Bookstore over the years. Uh, dear friend of mine, uh, Aubrey wrote a book called Spiritual Patriots. And uh, I think you would do well uh, to pick that up as well. And... Uh, there will be some things I will reference occasionally from that uh, as we go along as well. So uh, the theme of Jude, uh, I'm going to, I want to read something to you from Aubrey's book quickly to get going here. Who's a patriot? Let me ask you something. Not like raise your hand if you're a patriot. That's not what I mean. You've got your red, white, and blue tie on. I like that. And I say, who's a patriot? What is a patriot? I should have said. What is a patriot? What is it? What's a patriot in your mind? Zane Burns. Yeah, I like that definition. There's the idea of placing country ahead of self. Anybody else? Aubrey uh, says this, Patriots are people who passionately love their country and are willing to support and defend it with their very lives. Similar then, very similar to what Zane has suggested. Well, when he goes into this introductory stuff on the book of Jude, he'll say that same kind of devotion can be seen in the lives of the early Christians. Peter and John were beaten and commanded not to teach or preach in the name of Jesus, Although threatened with prison and death, they did not cease to proclaim the gospel. Paul was persecuted at every turn, yet never uh, shied away from his duty. Stephen was stoned, and James was beheaded for their uncompromising loyalty to Christ. Physical persecution is rare in American culture, but Christians must no less be determined to withstand the world and advance the kingdom of God. And so, Christians are soldiers of Christ, always on active duty. Okay? So, uh, that is sort of some introductory thought. One more thing he says on that. The book of Jude is God's field manual for spiritual engagement and his call to arms. He said, it reminds us that our adversary is real and determined. And he, he writes that a field manual is not something that is, is theory. A field manual is something that is very practical for use in the midst of battle. And I think that we'll find that uh, very accurate to the, uh, a very accurate description to the book of Jude. All right? So uh, we're going to get into the text a little bit and uh, talk a little more about Jude as we get into the text. But we're going to do verses 1 and 2. And I want to say this morning that he starts out with the, this, this is why he's writing this. If I am to know victory, okay, if we're in battle, if we're in battle. And let me tell you who, who I have great fear for or about. 
I have great fear for those that do not recognize they're in a battle. I have great fear for brothers and sisters in Christ and, and friends in Christ that do not live as if they're in a battle. They are on somewhat of a spiritual autopilot. They've been doing it a long time. And doing faith, if I can be that curt about it, doing faith is, is more about don't this, don't this, don't this, don't this, show up on Sunday morning or three times a week. And that's doing faith. Folks, let me tell you what I honestly believe. I honestly believe there are too many folks in too many congregations that are there every time the doors open that have a weak faith. They've, they've, they've got a good habit. And habits help faith. The right habits help faith. But similar to the idea of what we just started on Wednesday nights in this room, Habits of spiritual growth are those things that sometimes are referred to as the spiritual disciplines. A lack of spiritual discipline and habitual actions for the proactive purpose of building faith and growing in faith, the lack of that won't build anything. Even showing up. So... Uh, I fear for those that don't realize they're in a battle. Um, in basketball, other sports are similar. Football, they'll just change the, the phrase to field instead of court. But in basketball, they'll talk about somebody who has like court awareness. In football, they'll talk about a quarterback who has great field awareness. And the quarterback that just has a great feel... Generally, what they're referring to is he doesn't see it, but he can feel the rush coming from the backside. So he's not blindsided. We've got to have battle awareness. Um, can I tell you that nobody quits the church overnight? Can I tell you that I've gone through many church directories over the years and been reminded about people who had sort of been forgotten, reminded and saddened at what ha Oh, yeah, I remember. Whatever happened to them? I remember they quit coming. And when I say, and then I remember, no, they're not going anywhere. Talk to people that know them, best friends, that kind of thing, even relatives. Well... We're trying to get them started again, you know, that kind of thing. This doesn't happen like that. Uh, the things that happen, Dad used to say this, and I think it's applicable in a lot of different uses, for a lot of different uses. The things that happen don't just happen. They've been getting ready to happen for quite a while. That is, by the continuation of poor choices or the lack of the right ones. Either inappropriate, continuous inappropriate action or the lack of appropriate action. Proactively. Very rarely do the things that happen just happen. They've been getting ready to happen over time because of what somebody has or has not been doing with or in their life, or somebody else has not been doing, that winds up impacting the innocent person. The guy that hits somebody head on and takes away on a highway, on Highway 70 between Bellevue and, and White Bluff, the guy that hits somebody head on and takes out a dad and his four-year-old son, and has to be buried in the snow. And yeah, this is real. These are people I see. And has to be buried in the snow. And the mom and the sister who have lost a husband and a father and a brother and a son. The guy that hit that car head on and killed dad and four-year-old son. 
because he was stone drunk. You know when that happened? It didn't just happen. It happened earlier in the night when the guy made the choice he made. And it happened year over years of time when he got into that and got addicted to that. That's when that was getting ready to happen. And the same type of thing I want to use by illustration happens spiritually. I can tell you people that were some of, if not one of, if not the most popular Sunday school class teachers in congregations locally that don't attend anywhere anymore. What happened? He didn't like one sermon? I fear for people that do not see that they're in a battle. Because when you're not looking, we got problems. Ultimately, if I'm to know victory, I have to be willing to stand. You know, um, Elijah stood, well, certainly, he had a majority because he had his Lord, but as we look at things in human perspective, Elijah stood alone on Mount Carmel. And I love Elijah's showdown. I love reading that. I love reviewing that. For a, ver for a variety of reasons. I like what he says specifically. I like the boldness he brings to it. I like his sarcasm that he brings to the guys sometimes. Do you know what he, gen what literally, if you look at the most used uh, the, the way this Hebrew term is most used. When Elijah, you remember it back in the showdown, well, call louder, maybe he's this, when he talked about, to the prophets about, well, call louder, maybe he's this, maybe he's sleeping, maybe he's, remember that? Before he gets busy and calls on his God, our God. You know, one of the things he says, if you look at the Hebrew, and you look in context, and you look at how it's most used, maybe he's in the bathroom. That's what's literally there. And I'm being more general than what's literally there. I love what Elijah says, how he says it, and I love the confidence that he's given there. And I preached a sermon one time on Elijah and the showdown at Mount Carmel, and the title of the lesson was, Show Up for the Showdown. you got to show up for the showdown. If I am to know victory... I have to be willing to stand somewhere and stand strong there. So as we talked about earlier, this call to arms, which is a strategy, Jude's strategy uh, for spiritual victory. Uh, here's what's been going on. False teachers have infiltrated the church and were becoming a serious threat. Now listen. Be careful with the term false teachers or false teaching. Be careful with that and what you think Scripture was meaning to false teaching versus what sometimes some of our own brethren will look at as false teaching. False teaching in the first century and false teaching in the time of the apostles was very different than what we talk about a lot of times and view as such. But false teaching has infiltrated, has been coming. It's not just on its way. It has made inroads into the church and they were becoming a serious threat or it was becoming a serious threat. Um, every once in a while, we will hear of somebody that has been diagnosed with something and it's so... <clears throat> advanced. Maybe, maybe it's cancer. There's some situation and it is so advanced. Maybe you've heard this. They thought they were going to be doing at least some exploratory stuff, some sort of exploratory procedure or maybe even surgical procedure. And maybe you've heard the phrase, they just closed them back up. They just looked and they just closed them back up and said... And what they meant right there was make, make your arrangements. 
and we just hate hearing that. You can just kind of say, oh, you know, you can just only I can only imagine. And there are people that hear that in the church. There are people that creep all over the years that have heard that, or their family members have heard that sort of thing. There's nothing they can do. But outside of those situations, it's a very rare thing, isn't it? When somebody is diagnosed with something and says, well, I'm just going to hope it goes away. Right? I mean, we want to live. Here's some 34-year-old and they've got a, a, you know, a seven-year-old and a, and a four-year-old and a newborn. Well, I want to live. My, my, I, want, I want my children to have a daddy. So the idea that, listen, this is in the body. This is in the body. Now we're talking about a spiritual body, a spiritual house, God's house, God's people, His church. The idea that, hey, listen, this, this, is, this has made its way into the body. And we just say, I sure hope that will go away. No. And this is Jude's, as I said earlier, call to arms. You know, every once in a while, we are assuming, rightly so, or I say assuming, we are saying, and rightly so, who shepherds the flock? And we say, well, the elders, the shepherds shepherd. But in another sense, and, and certainly that's so, but in another sense, throughout the New Testament, God places and urges upon the whole body to be watchmen, to pay attention to certain things. And when, not just for something that might make its way in, but when something's there, they don't just say, well, I hope it'll go away. So the book of Jude is largely written because a disease has entered the body, a disease of false teachers, false teaching, and there was a brief window of opportunity to stop its progress. You know, back to that same illustration, one reason somebody's got to kind of get on something as quickly as possible is because they have a brief window of opportunity. And this is sort of thematic to Jude as a whole, as a book, and especially its beginning. So he's going to urge them to unite in faith and, and fight, unite in faith, unite in truth, and, and fight false teaching. Now, does he know that God's truth will ultimately win out in the end? Well, of course. Uh, somebody, uh, so, somebody get go over to the Old Testament, and let's get a reading from, this may seem an odd place to you uh, to get this, but I, let's get a reading from Esther chapter 4, verse 14. Esther chapter 4, verse 14. So when you get there, just go right ahead. Just read loud enough for everybody to hear. Esther 4, 14. God is certain to prevail, to prevail in the end, but what about the unspeakable and hard to even measure losses? See, this idea that, well, look, I've read First and Second Peter. And because I've read First and Second Peter, I can say, well, thematically, it's hold on, hold on. Those books were written to say, hold on, they were under a great persecution. Those books were written to say, hold on, Christians win in the end. Okay. Even though that's coming, even though that's certain, that doesn't mean there are no losses along the way. And shouldn't we care about losses along the way? Back to my church directory analogy. 
Mom knows what I'm talking about. Uh, she could, uh, she could, she could think of more people than I could probably. Uh, going back to early years at Bellevue, 1967. And uh, so when Dad started at, at Bellevue, I was 10 months old. And uh, those first directory pictures, and, and then over the years, you go back through. You don't have to have as many years as he did there. For example, just prior to coming here, I was at Center Chapel 12 years. I can go back through our directory over a, just a 12-year period. And we're like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I go through there and you see people that have died and gone on to their reward and we're happy for them. Miss them, but happy for them. But I'm talking about the other people. Yeah. What about the losses along the way? We, we get the end. We know the end. The battle's already been fought and won. It's over. We know that, right? It's over. But what about the losses along the way? This is Jude's concern. And so the idea, according to Jude, if you kind of, as we go through the book, I think you're going to see his attitude is not that, well, I don't know, that's up to the shepherds. That's up to the shepherds. I'm going to let the shepherds shepherd, and I'm going to, I'm going to get busy in the real important stuff like, the, what they set the thermostat on. Right? Stuff like that. And so Jude is going to urge them to unite and troop and, and fight because they've got a small window of opportunity. So this is, this is Jude's theme. And we'll see more of that, about that throughout the book. Well, who is Jude? Well, he was raised in a Jewish family in Nazareth. He was the half-brother of Jesus, we believe. Matthew chapter 13, 55 and 56 will list several brothers of Jesus. Matthew 13, 55 and 56. He is listed in, this, uh, in, the, in that list. He's, he's one that's listed. Uh, let's go to John, though. Let's go to John chapter 7. Hold your place there in Jude. Let's go to John chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. John chapter 7, verses 3 through 5. And if somebody will read that when you get there. John 7, 3 through Not even his brothers. Now let's think about why that might be. What, what, do you, what do you got? What do you think? Why wouldn't his brothers, not even his brothers, Scripture says, not even. We understand when the word even is put down, it, it's put there for a reason. In other words, this is something that, that is really potentially mind-boggling to us when we put the word even down. Why would his, even his brothers not believe? Yet. 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 yet, that's, that's coming. coming, but yet. But yet. Why, not? Why, not? Why not? Yeah. Yeah. This is the prophecy? Yeah. I know where he was born and it wasn't fit for a king. Okay. What else? You know, uh, I think I've used this illustration before. Um, many of you know who I mean. If not, most of you will have heard the name by now because it's been on the airwaves and 
popularized for so long now, but the financial uh, guru, Dave Ramsey, know who I'm talking about? And uh, he had a phrase, I'll change it a little bit, but basically he had a phrase he would refer to when somebody would call in and say, well, this is what's going on, this in my family, my, this, this is the problem with my, my, my 80 year old mom won't listen to me about this or my whatever, you, you know, parent won't listen. And, and even though that person may be 45 or 50 years old and in that business and has been in that business for 30 years, the, the mom still won't, or whatever. And he called, he had a term for that. And when he would term that, he'd say, what I mean is once somebody is, and I'm going to change the term, uh, change the term, he'd say once somebody, basically what he's saying is once somebody's changed your diaper, they really don't want to take financial advice from you. So, in other words, they can't, in other words, they can't see you out of that. That's, right? I mean, anybody in here, raise your hand if you've got children that are over the age of 20. Okay, yeah, half the room. We're close. Over the age of 20. Okay, so in other words, basic adult years. Adult years. Are they, are they an adult to you? Well, that depends on what you're wanting them to do or what you're frustrated with them about or whatever. Don't lie. I know this is true. It's hard for you not to see them as still your baby. Am I right? Right? Well, his brothers can only see what they've seen. This is what I remember. This is the prophecy. So his brothers don't believe him. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. We know that passage of Scripture, but what, what did that include? That included, I think, a very normal upbringing and existence. Now, why do I say that? Because we get very little about the upbringing of Jesus, right? Here's why I believe I can say that. First of all, from this passage right here, in one sense, logic demands, I think, we go back to that. One reason is brothers would have had trouble believing. His family would have had trouble believing. That, I don't think that would be the case, nearly as likely the case, if he had had an, an extraordinary, very unusual upbringing, doing very unusual things. Now, we know that when he got to age 12, what's he doing? What's he doing when he's 12? Yeah, yeah, he's in Jerusalem, he's up at the temple, and he's arguing with teachers, right? By the way, I don't know if I've ever used this illustration or not here, but, um, you know, Mom and Dad, it took many, 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 many Bible trips, many trips, rather, to the Bible lands, and we, you know, the kids got to go on some of those, and and I was able to take Jana and things like that, um, and uh, my brother... Ben got to go, of course. And he was, I think, am I right, he was 12? You don't remember? I'm pretty sure it was 12. Because I, when I heard that, I couldn't stop thinking about Jesus being lost in Jerusalem at age 12. My brother was 12, and they were pulling off to go somewhere. It was time to go to the next site, next place, whatever, go wherever they were headed. And can't find Phil. 12 in Jerusalem. And I imagine that I would have probably said something like this if it had been me and not him and I'd been a little older and smart enough by that time to think of it. I would just say, just trying to be like Jesus. I was just trying to be like Jesus. His brothers saw a normal upbringing. And I believe logic demands that for several reasons. Here's another reason. What does Hebrews teach constantly? Why is Jesus a new and better, not just a new, but a better mediator under a better covenant? Why is he a better high priest? Well, what Hebrews teaches is he's better because he can understand certain things from the things he himself has suffered. And so there had to be a normalcy for a time of understanding and upbringing for that to be so with Jesus. 
his life as a in the flesh as a man so there might be other reasons too that we could come to with relating to why his brothers don't believe him but it wouldn't be the first time that whether it's sibling rivalry at least one-sided whether it's sibling rivalry or any other uh, the, the normalcy of his upbringing that which they've seen is the only thing that they can call to mind but then the resurrection happened let's go to Acts chapter 1 verse 14 what's happening in Acts 1 when we get to verse 14, somebody read that. Who's there in prayer post-resurrection? Those that didn't believe it. Well, these brothers would go on and uh, have significant roles in the kingdom. Jude was one we know was very active. Evidence points to him being a traveling missionary with his wife along uh, during that time as well, aiding in his ministry. And you can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5, for example, for that. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 5. <coughs> Again. So that's a little bit about Jude. Again, a summary of the letter. The purpose is to sound an urgent warning against emerging worldliness and to challenge them, as we sometimes have seen in Scripture, to contend for the faith. Now listen, what do I mean by contend? Somebody, what does contend mean to you? This is important. What does contend mean to you? A continuation in striving for some purpose. Okay. Anybody else? Does contend sound rather passive? Not to me. Does contend seem like it puts some effort there? Does contend sound like effort? I'm trying to get there, and it's not that I reach it based on perfection, but I'm, I'm ever striving, back to your word, yeah, there's an ultimate goal down there. And the word, I don't think any of us really see the word contend as passive, benign, if you will. Uh, so contend means something. He's going to urge them to contend uh, against this emerging worldliness and false teaching in the church. Okay, so Jude, verse 1 and 2, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, the called, rather, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. It doesn't seem like much in just two rather short verses, each one. Uh, but uh, let's look at the introduction. How does he introduce himself? He introduces himself as the brother of James. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Has anybody got a big brother that you were always very proud of growing up and wanted to be like? Uh, did you ever have a big sister like that? A sibling that you wanted to be? Or maybe in later years, once you were both adults, it went reverse. I tell you my little brother, I tell you what my little brother's doing, you know? Did, you tell me, did I tell you about my sister? You, you know, my little brother just got drafted by the Titans, right? I mean, you know, if I'd had a little brother and he'd just gotten drafted by the Titans, I'd be telling everybody I passed in Kroger, you know, right? I mean, did you ever have that kind of, that kind of pride? Jude introduces himself not as somebody who, would, who is already having a prominent role, maybe even a more prominent role to come, he doesn't talk about who he is. Jude, brother of James, you know, that kind of thing. Brother of James. James had a more prominent role than Jude. 1 Corinthians 15, 
uh, chapter 7, Galatians 2, chapter 9, for example. But uh, he's uh, willing to take second place. Less visible, no apparent resentment in the way that he introduces his letter, no apparent resentment over that. It reminds me of this, Jonathan to, with David. Jonathan was the heir to the throne. And he, you know. Jonathan to David, John the Baptist to Jesus. Famous words, he must, dot, 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 I must, dot, dot, dot. What is it? He must increase. I must, yeah. Andrew to Peter. We hear a lot about one sibling, not as much about the other, but who brought him in the first place. Andrew brought him in the first place. I love this phrase. I don't know the first time I saw it. A person cannot exalt Christ and self at the same time. That's a pretty good phrase, isn't it? A person cannot exalt Christ and self at the same time. Jude, his introduction is not about who he is. He's, he's maybe proud of his brother, but he's going to exalt in someone else. He calls himself a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Uh, the great leaders of the New Testament, as they write, uh, as they introduce various thoughts, even the books they write themselves are various thoughts within the book. They refer to themselves as servants with this idea, I think, being key. Representing God, not self, man's biggest importance on what he can do for others. Matthew 23, verse 11, we don't have time to look at this morning. But Matthew 23, verse 11 would be a good citation there to make if you're taking notes on this idea that man's importance is based on what he can do for others. Remember, a man cannot exalt self and Christ at the same time. Okay, so we almost got where I wanted to get, but not quite. But with introductory stuff, that's not surprising. We'll continue to finish out verse 1 and 2 and get into verses 3 and 4 next, uh, next week. We'll talk a little bit about who he's writing to and what he calls them in this introduction in the first two verses. Who he's writing to and what he calls them and the importance of the terms he uses. There, there are important things about the terms that he uses uh, to those receiving his letter. We'll, we'll talk about why those terms are important. And then we'll keep going. All right? So it's 10.15. We got to go.